in East Africa and the Great Lakes region, German colonial ambitions started out as an anti-slavery exercise. But by 1907, much of East Africa was under German rule. This conquest spurred courageous resistance from many local East African groups against well-armed and violent colonial forces. This is Shadows of German Colonialism. At the Berlin Conference in 1885, Germany claimed territories in today's mainland Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi, which formed German East Africa. It was a significant chunk of land that was a colony more in theory than in reality, because Germany actually didn't have state authority over the region. Instead, German presence in East Africa had been limited to the land grabbing of private colonialists like Karl Peters. There's this perception that Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was against colonies, which I don't find accurate. By the 1860s, there were German trading firms present across Africa, along with French, British and American counterparts. They practiced so-called economic colonialism or enclave colonialism. That's German historian Brigitte Reinwald. And Bismarck favored this when establishing the German Empire and saw Britain as both a role model but also a great competitor. And as competition for colonies increased, Germany did not want to be left behind. It was very important for a colonial empire to take into account the civil society interest groups, like the German East Africa Company, where the infamous Karl Peters played a large role. He was also a key player in the Berlin Conference and had previously acquired lands in East Africa as protectorates of the German Empire. After the Berlin Conference, German claims were violently enforced. In 1888, German settlements on the East African coast came under attack during the Abu Shiri or Arab uprising. This was a mix of actors on the Swahili coast with ties to local leader Abu Shiri bin Salim al hat who did not want Germany to threaten their lucrative caravan ivory and slave trading routes. Ironically, Germany justified using arms and ammunition as a means to end the slave trade. In reality though, weapons and soldiers protected German interests. Initially, the notorious Wismantruppe, a precursor to the colonial era Schutztruppe or protection force, which was run by Hermann von Wismann, rampaged through East Africa with modern, quick-firing weapons like the new Maxim machine gun. This group, although it clearly served German or private interests, purposefully operated with little accountability. It wasn't an official German militia and made use of African recruits, also known as Askaris. These men were crucial in carrying out atrocities that characterized German rule in East Africa. Hangings, rape and plunder followed, and by 1891, the East African coast was under German control. The Askaris came uh, mostly from today's Sudan and, and South Africa. So these were people that were um, taken re really young and trained uh, as soldiers by the white officers. And and then sent there. And the thing is that they were kind of enjoying impunity. That's Jan Legal from the NGO Berlin Postcolonial in Germany. And they but they weren't they were completely uprooted from their communities. So they were in a in a place where they didn't know anybody, where they didn't speak the language. So the, this way German colon, the German colonial military managed to really separate the local population from their soldiers and the soldiers had less empathy, so, so the soldiers had less empathy, so to say. With the lucrative Swahili coast under German rule, the colonists looked inland towards Lake Tanganyika, where they encountered strong resistance, perhaps none more famous than that of Wahehe leader Mkwawa. German commander Emil Zalewski, who some historians argue actually triggered the Arab revolt of 1888, was tasked with destroying the Hehe, and he employed scorched earth tactics, burning farms and destroying livestock. Here's Tanzanian historian Philemon Mtoy. Uh, Mkwawa and the other chiefs, they were tired of the humiliation and exploitation that were caused 
by the German administrations. And the German administrations from 1885 to 1906 was characterized by a genocide kind of administrations. So Mkwawa today is the hero. An astute diplomat, Mkwawa was also a great military tactician. The Wahehe surrounded and killed most of Zalewski's forces, including Zalewski, in 1891. It was an embarrassing defeat the German colonialists would never forget. And though the Wahehe fought a guerrilla war, Mkwawa was eventually surrounded and chose to take his own life in the Iringa region rather than submit to the German forces in 1898. So hated was Mkwawa by the German colonialists that after his death, Mkwawa's head was taken to Berlin. Mangi Meli, a Wachaga ruler from the slopes of Kilimanjaro, was also attacked and forced to surrender. He, along with other Chaga noblemen, were hanged in 1900 for treason. The killings not only destroyed the fabric of local leadership, but were exacerbated when German colonial authorities beheaded Mangi Meli and sent his skull to Berlin, allegedly for anthropological and scientific racism research. To this day, Mangi Meli's skull has been preserved in a German museum. The Chaga do believe up to now that their loved one should not be buried anywhere else but Kilimanjaro. Now, for these ancestors of we are talking about, these were royal people, these were leaders. That's Tanzanian historian Valon Selayo from the Tumayini University Dar es Salaam College. The Chaga do believe. They believe the day, if they are not, if the ritual is not, it's not properly followed, they will still move around and the community might be associated with different ill doings, social, economic, political uh, diseases, all attributed to this brother of, who is not yet buried properly. In 1905, over 20 communities united under Kinjeketile Nguale and rose up to fight harsh German rule, taxation and forced labor, specifically to produce cotton. Kinjeketile is a somewhat controversial figure because he relayed a prophecy that said indigenous fighters could expel the German invaders and should consume a potion to turn the colonizers' bullets into water. This inspired what's now known as the Maji Maji resistance. Historians like Nyaka Mboro Sururu see this Maji Maji war as a culmination of desperation against German colonialism. People, they didn't really took that the bullets will turn to water, but because they were so already fed up, what next to do? We cannot, we cannot go on as a forced laborers without a wage, and also they are demanding us we have to pay taxes, which we don't have even a single cent. And people, they were already in the mood. So you find people were totally motivated. While initial skirmishes did see some German missionaries and settlers killed, the Maji Maji resistance faced a series of punitive measures taken by colonial authorities. It was in July 1905. The Germans caught Kinjektile and hanged him. There is where the Germans is where then again they did motivate more the people by hanging Kinjektile. But even though Kinjektile was dead, the Schutztruppe continued with scorched earth tactics, executions and terror in East Africa. It was strategically planned this way, according to Philemon Mtoy. Let me just give you an statement by the Captain Tom von Prince in 1914. He said, and I quote, The stomach is what affects the Negro the most. And this reality would help me years later in bringing the harsh mentality of the Hehe under German rule. The, the Scotch S is actually, by definition, you can tell, is a military strategy of burning, destroying crops, homes, and livestock or other resources that might be used to an invadee enemy force. The Scotch S leads to the famine and the spread of epidemic, epidemic disease. The revolt lasted until 1907 and cost over 120,000 lives, and some estimates put that figure as high as 300,000, with many people dying of starvation and disease. While often termed the Maji Maji Rebellion, 
Historians like Mtoy dispute this characterization. Why do you say uh, Maj Maj war is Maj Maj rebellions? I don't mm. want that term. Because rebellion, it means it is people who are, are going against the legitimate leadership that has been, but there was no le legitimate leadership during the colonial period. Our land has been taken by force. The Abu Shiri revolt, the Wahehe uprising, and the Maji Maji were anti-colonialist conflicts that were crushed under unimaginable brutality, borne mainly by civilians. For Dar es Salaam-based historian Justina Somwell Komba, the Maji Maji resistance still carries weight and remains highly symbolic. Even people uh, from the place where Maji Maji took place, they treat Maji Maji as a symbol of unity. It's some kind of identifying them. They are warriors, fighters for their freedom. It was the same spirit used by other um, society to fight for independence. And while German rule in East Africa ended in 1918, the effects of the Maji Maji still impacted generations of East Africans, which only recovered when independence arrived in the 1960s. Although Tanzania, we say that Tanzanian uh, got independence just uh, in a peaceful way. And, um, but to tell you the truth, that peaceful it has a lot, of, a wider meaning in it. People suffered before calling it peaceful means. So it, it's a term of identifying people, and sometimes it is used as something memorial, something to remember. It's in the memory of people. So we have passed it all the way through Maji Maji and other resistance just to fight for freedom. It's a kind of identity uh, which um, have been used to unify people and sometimes to make people to remember their past. Shadows of German Colonialism was brought to you by DW with support from the German Federal Foreign Office. I'm Kai Nebe. Mm -hmm.